Um, this morning we're very pleased to welcome back again uh, Mrs. Avril Heening, uh, credited pre- preacher from PCI, and we're very pleased to see her here again. Uh, Reverend McBride will be returning back on to, to, tonight, so she'll be back in, in business uh, all week. So we're looking forward to getting her again next week. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Freddie, for your welcome. It's lovely to be here with you again today. Daniel 4 says, How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Let's just pray. Lord, we praise you that you are a wondrous God who has built an eternal kingdom for us. As we gather to worship you this morning, still our hearts and minds from the busyness of the last week and draw us into your presence. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our opening praise is You're the Word of God the Father. Let's come together before God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the Lord of every nation. We thank you that your love does ring out across the lands. And we thank you that that love was so evident towards us when you sent your Son to save us. Lord, we know that we let you down so many times and so often. But we praise you that you have provided a way for us to come back to you. We thank you for the atoning, rescuing and redeeming work of Jesus on the cross. Let us never ever take for granted the cost and the price of our salvation. We thank and praise you that you are a God who is faithful. And we pray that we will be able to grow in our faith and serve you as we should serve. We thank you for the many mercies and grace that you extend to us day by day, month by month, year by year. Creator God, you have made us in your image. Let us always remember that we are here and made to serve you, to bring glory to you and to bring glory to your son Jesus. We ask that you bless us 
that you draw near to us as we spend time with you, so that when we leave this place, others will see that we have been with you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So we've got some girls and boys here today, and I need a wee bit of audience interaction, okay? Who's your favourite superhero? We anybody? What do we think? Superman. I love Superman. Anybody like Batman? Hands up. Anybody like Spider-Man? Yeah, I love Spider-Man. Anybody like Iron Man? Yeah, isn't he awesome? Anybody like Wonder Woman or is that too old now? <laughs> is she too old? I used to love Wonder Woman whenever I was a little girl. And some of the mums and dads will also remember the bionic man and the bionic woman. And there was even a bionic da dog. Don't we love superheroes, action heroes, people who we look at, who we think are really brave. My children's favourite was Buzz Lightyear. They used to go around the house saying all the time, to infinity and beyond, whatever that meant, Buzz Lightyear was the guy. And the thing about superheroes is we expect them to come in and rescue us. We expect them to be really, really brave. And we expect them to just provide a means to sort all the bad guys out. And we think they're brave. And sometimes we think, oh, if only I could have the courage of Superman or Spider-Man or Batman or Buzz Lightyear. But here's the thing. We're going to be hearing later on about three men who were superheroes, but they weren't superheroes for the big, brave actions that they took with respect to beating the bad guys. These guys were heroes because they had the courage to stand up for something that they knew was wrong and they knew that they did not want to be any part of it. And it takes real courage, real bravery, to be a real superhero whenever your friends are maybe trying to get you to do something that you know isn't right. When maybe there's a bit of bullying going on in school and you see someone who's really upset. It takes real courage not to join in, but to actually go and be nice and be friendly to the person who's having a really hard time. Real courage sometimes is quiet courage, and it's not the big razzmatazz of the superhero. And as we come to here today about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, we can see how God, who was faithful, intervened and gave them the ability to stand up and to have courage and to stand true and firm for God. And it's my prayer that as we go through the service today, that we all will become superheroes, people who are ready and willing to take their stand for God. Now we're going to sing our children's hymn, If I Come to Jesus.
We're going to continue our journey through the book of Daniel, and we come to Daniel chapter 3 today. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. Now that's about 90 feet. And he set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. And we think it was maybe some sort of brick kiln. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced to the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual, and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, fully clothed, were thrown into the furnace. The king's command was so urgent, and the furnace so hot, that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped up to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of one of the gods. 
Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And we know that God will bless the reading of his word. So we're moving on through the book of Daniel this morning. And by way of recap in chapter one, we saw that God was sovereign even in the midst of his people's tragedy. And in chapter two, we saw that God's kingdom will prevail and be established and will prevail and rule over all. And in chapter three, as we look at this really familiar story that we all remember from Sunday school, we will see that God is faithful to his people and we can also learn something about faith along the way. So let's look at verses 1 to 7. Nebuchadnezzar, maybe sometime after Daniel had interpreted his dream, decides he's going to build a 90 foot high golden statue, as you do. It must have been possibly of either himself or something else. We don't know, but we know that either way it was huge, 90 feet tall. And to give you a sense of scale, the Kelpies, you know those horses' heads in Scotland, are about 90 feet high, or 30 metres. And the Christ the Redeemer statue in Brazil is about 120 feet. So that gives you a sense of the size of something we're talking about. And as we think back to this huge golden statue, what we see is that idolatry leads to a rejection of God. After building it, Nebuchadnezzar summoned a who's who of the great and the good. Senior government officials, judges, top civil servants, accountants, lawyers, anybody who was anybody was invited to the dedication of the statue. When Nebuchadnezzar called, they came and no expense was spared. He even had booked the Royal Babylonian Philharmonic Orchestra. Think of it. A huge glittering colossus surrounded by very important people. The scene is suitably impressive. And then the herald steps forward and commands the people that when they hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the flute and all kinds of music, they're to fall to their knees and worship this big amazing statue that Nebuchadnezzar has built. But If you don't worship it, if you fail to call down, well, do you see over there? There's a burning, fiery furnace, possibly a brick kiln, and you'll have to go in there. Picture the scene, silence, as everyone's waiting for the band to strike up. The music was to be the signal. One scholar has said it's no accident that music was involved as well as the threat of the furnace. The furnace was an ugly threat for those who were minded to disobey, but the music was to perform a different role. It was to inspire, it was to seduce conformance. Nebuchadnezzar knows how powerful music can be. And think of ourselves, music often stirs us, moves us, and in many cases reflects our values and identities. And Nebuchadnezzar, well, he made it so easy Listening to the strains of the great music would overcome any lingering doubts anybody had. The music would fire them up to fall down and worship, to obey, to conform, to follow the crowd. The stage is set 
and wholesale idolatry was going to be very, very easy. But what about us? Is wholesale idolatry easy for us as well? You see, we're not talking about worshipping something that we're going to build out in the car park after the service. We know the first two commandments. Exodus 20 sets them out. We're to have no other gods before God. And we're not to make any images to worship. It's why we don't have statues in our churches. But here's the thing. An idol doesn't have to be a statue. Today, we can easily dilute our worship and adoration of God by elevating almost anything else to that place of first importance in our lives, whether it's family, work, wealth, the house, the car. Calvin has said that the human mind is a factory of idols. And even as Christians, our minds are often in full factory assemble mode. Temptation can come from any source. We might want power at home or in church or in work. We might make one particular relationship an idol. We might be gearing our lives and decisions around not what we understand to be God's will, but rather the will of a spouse or a child or a friend. The list is vast, and that's why the danger is so real for us. Seduction is subtle, and that's why we slip so easily into idol worship. Because an idol is anything we have and hold ahead of God. It's not a wee statue in the corner. But at the heart of the idols we worship, the things we reject or replace or downgrade God in favour of, at its heart is self. All substitutes for God are ultimately the idol of self. God created us to have a relationship with him, but that relationship was broken in the Garden of Eden because what self wanted, self took, and sin entered the world. And yes, we may not make physical idols, but what today is standing in the way of our right relationship with God? Think about something in your life that you devote more time, care, and attention to than the things of God. What or who takes your eyes off God? Who is on the throne of your life? Because if it's not the God of the Bible, it's an idol. An idol worship leads to rejection of God. And as we move on through the story, by verse 7, we see that Nebuchadnezzar's plan looks like a complete success. The band is played, everybody obeyed, it was a case of job done, great day out, box ticked, king obeyed, jobs and lives secure, a good day's work. Maybe the king hadn't noticed that there were three people who had not, in fact, bowed down Three people who had not conformed, who had not worshipped, who had not obeyed, who had not followed the crown. But Nebuchadnezzar wasn't allowed to not notice their non-conformance for very long. Because in this section, we start to see the price of spiritual integrity. And look who grasped these three men up. Other astrologers possibly the ones whom Daniel had actually saved in chapter 2 when he was able to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And in verses 8 to 12, we see them. Hi, Your Majesty. Do you remember that law you made that when the orchestra began to play that everyone was to fall flat on their faces and worship that lovely big idol you made? Well, guess what? There are certain Jews, oh, but Your Majesty, not just any Jews, you remember those smart boys who came top in chapter one at King's College Babylon? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember them? You appointed them to be governors of certain provinces of Babylon. Well, they didn't bow down. They don't serve your gods. They don't do what you say. And Nebuchadnezzar's raging, and he summons the three men before him. Is it true that you don't serve my gods or bow to my idol? Now I'm going to give you one more chance. If the band strikes up and you fall down and worship my lovely statue, fantastic. But if you don't, you're going to be cast into the fiery furnace and what god will be able to rescue you from my hand then? 
And we see here the spiritual integrity displayed by the three men when it looked like what it was going to cost them to defy Nebuchadnezzar. You see, as we said to the children, real courage, spiritual integrity resists the power of pressure to conform, to do something that isn't right. Nebuchadnezzar's big statue was intended to dominate, to impress, but most of all, to encourage conformity. Paul tells us in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Because spiritual integrity resists the pressure to conform. And how hard is it today for us as Christians to maintain our spiritual integrity in today's secular, postmodern society? You see, we display our faith in not just how we act, but how we react. It's about, as Paul commands us in Ephesians 4.15, to speak the truth in love. Christian values are under threat today in our own country. The sanctity of life threatened with the abortion of babies. The nature of marriage changed and the fluidity of gender assignment. The world thinks in a way very different to the way of Jesus. Do we react as we should? Do we react compassionately, pastorally and biblically? When these three men are brought in for interrogation, they show that their quiet rebellion earlier, their failure to conform, to bow to pressure, did not hide a heart of cowardice. They calmly and boldly proclaim their faith without hesitation. And could the same be said of us? Let's look at what they say. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego's answer focuses on the ability and pleasure of God. They tell Nebuchadnezzar in verse 17 that if they're thrown into that furnace, the God they serve is able to deliver them and will deliver them. But here's the rub. They tell Nebuchadnezzar that even if God does not deliver them, it makes no difference. They're still not going to serve Nebuchadnezzar's God or worship that big idol. God was able and is able to save, but these men said, even if he doesn't, it's not making a difference. We are not going to do what we know is wrong. The price of spiritual integrity means standing firm to the end. And Nebuchadnezzar discovered that these men valued something more than their very lives. And as a result, he had no authority over them. These men resisted idolatry because they knew idolatry was a rejection of God. These men knew the price of spiritual integrity when they refused to conform and bow and what that was going to mean for them. And these men could do all of that because they had faith in a faithful God, even though they didn't know what God was going to do. And what matters for these men is not actually deliverance, but obedience. And they give us a full balanced picture of true faith. It's a faith that knows the power of God. He is able, as I said to Nebuchadnezzar in verse 17. It's a faith that guards the freedom of God. But if not, if God chooses not to, It's a faith that holds the truth of God. We won't serve your your gods, Nebuchadnezzar. Faith does not predict God's ways. It simply trusts and holds on to God's word. Faith obeys God's truth and doesn't seek to manipulate God's hand. And faith's finest hours for these three men may be when they actually said to him, God can save, but if not, we still will not conform. And we know how the story ends. The three men were not delivered from the furnace, but they were delivered in the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar observes three men and then a fourth man with them in the furnace, all untied, 
and the fourth man, Nebuchadnezzar describes, depending on the translation we use, as looking like a son of the gods or the son of God. Some scholars think that this was a pre-incarnate Jesus who joined the men there. And we don't, won't know the answer to that until we get to heaven. And whatever or whoever was in that fiery furnace, I don't think the, best, the basic message of the passage is altered. We learn that God is present with his people in whatever they face. And he is the only God who can save. Nebuchadnezzar realizes that there's something different about these men. He recognizes that they serve the Most High God. And as they come out of the, the fiery furnace with not a whiff or trace of smoke around them, Nebuchadnezzar actually starts to praise God. And he praised God because he saw the difference in them. We people recognize that we serve the Most High God? Maybe not always, because for us, the price of spiritual integrity might be costly. If we confess Jesus as Lord, and we confess the truth of the Bible today, to put that truth out there, to comment publicly on matters which do not conform to the worldview, may cost us promotion, friends, family, and not for us, but for Christians in North Korea and Afghanistan, very life itself. We have a God who is faithful to us. We have a God who decides in his grace and mercy to make his dwelling among us and to shape us into the kind of people he created and called us to be. We have a God who is faithful. And as we close today, three little summary points. We need to understand our own idolatry. If we're honest with ourselves, there are plenty of things in our lives that we find ourselves doing and following week to week and loving week to week much more than we love God. We need to ask God who is faithful towards his people to expose those idols and to root them out of our minds and our hearts. We should expect persecution now, I'm not talking about what's going on in Afghanistan or North Korea, but we live in a time where if we do stand up for Jesus and we talk about God's standards of holiness, we will be shot down in opposition. And it happens both inside the church and outside the church. John tells us in 1 John 3, 13, don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. If you are living a faithful life to Jesus, if you are not conforming to the ways of the world, you're not at times going to have a very comfortable existence. This world is not where we should feel at home. Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to another king. We belong to a better king and a king who makes his dwelling with his people. And finally, we need to remember that we can rest in the presence of God. The promise we have from God again and again is that not that we're going to avoid trouble or problems, but the promise we have from God is that we have someone who walks with us in whatever it is we're called to endure. We belong to someone who is faithful to be with us. We belong to someone who is faithful to nourish us. And we belong to someone who is faithful, who, even if the flames consumed us, will lead us home. Do we really belong to him today? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you that you have promised that you will never leave us or forsake us. And we pray, Lord, that as we go into this week, that we really will have the courage to stand for you, that we really will have the courage not to conform to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we pray that we will live our lives in such a way that others will see the difference in us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our closing hymn is Hear the Call of the Kingdom.
pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. See you.